the Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, it's a podcast about recovery. My name is Casey Scott. I'm the host, and if you need some help, do what I did and give Pinnacle Recovery Center a call. They set me on my road to recovery, and of course, we've always got Dr. Matt here. How are you? I'm good, Casey. How are you doing? And then we got Josh running the board. We'll introduce you to the guests in just a little bit, but more importantly, I've got a serious question I've got to ask you. All right. It's a uh, two-parter. Uh, two-parter? Yep. All right, I'm prepared. Go ahead. Part one. Yeah. Have you ever had a hickey? Um, I think I... Yes, once. Once in high school, I had a hickey. Okay. Yeah. Part two. Yeah. Have you ever given a hickey? No, I don't think so. Like, when I was growing up in high school... No, no, no. I mean, I did. Okay. Yes, I did. Once. But on purpose. Okay. It was more like joking around. Okay. And who yeah. did you give it to? Well, a, a girl. Okay. Yeah. Because when I was growing up in high school, hickeys were a real thing. Yeah. People would like make out. It just seemed unnecessarily painful. Yeah. I always thought the make out should be kind of enjoyable and nice and no pain. I don't know if the hickeys were invented by the turtleneck uh, industry. <laughs> Maybe. You know, because that seemed to be the only time you ever wore a turtleneck was to cover the cover hickey. Cover up the hickeys, yeah. It's the middle of summer. You're yeah. wearing a turtleneck. You automatically oh. assume... That guy's got a hickey. What are those called where it's just, it's a dicky? Oh, it's a dicky. <laughs> just to cover up the hickey. You need a dicky yeah. for the hickey. <laughs> there you go. That's right. right. I just don't think the kids today now deal with hickeys. You know, it's come to think of it, I, I, don't hear, I don't hear my kids talking about them. I haven't spotted any on my boys. I, I once had a lot of hickeys. I and, can believe that. And I was freezing spoons, trying to rub them off. And this was before the internet, so you just had to take some dude's word for it. You weren't it. using a vacuum. It no. was an actual hickey. Well, we've done that before, too. <laughs> but, I mean, there was all these remedies to get rid of your hickeys, and one was a frozen spoon. Frozen spoon? And so you would oh. do that. It did, did it work? No. Oh. And then you rub toothpaste on it. Or you'd have to borrow some girl's makeup foundation and cover it up. It does sound like a turtleneck conspiracy. Nothing else worked but that. The hickey is a turtleneck conspiracy. Yeah. So I have a question for you. It's just a one-parter. Sure. Why is this on your mind? You know what? That's (laughs) because I'm sober and my mind is working a lot. And so I'm always just thinking of stuff. Okay. And so I was actually, my girlfriend this morning uh, was driving me to the gym. Yeah. And I just looked over at her neck, and she's got a pretty neck. And I was like, have you ever had a hickey? And she goes, why are we talking about this? Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm going to make that my Facebook question of the day. There you go. So people are on there talking about their hickeys. Yeah, I liked, I liked your Facebook post about the hickey. Yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty good picture that you put up. I remember from Greece, a hickey from Kanicki's like a Hallmark card. Oh, there you go. Remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so today we're talking about a 12-step, 12-step program, but this one's more lds based. Based, and we're going to get into that in just a second. What's LDS? Latter day Saints. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints for our listeners that aren't okay. you know, familiar. I was like, right. Are you testing me? I grew up in this state. I know what LDS <laughs> is. LDS, LSD, it's it's a fine I mean, you know, it's a drug show. And, I think you should just stop right there. I probably should. Yeah, I think no, but I but we have we have, thankfully, many listeners outside of the state of Utah. And so I just wanted to clarify that. I don't like to brag, but our numbers uh, over eighty thousand downloads. Yeah, yeah, we're doing well. Fifty-two states, mm-hmm. thirty-two countries. Yep, and uh, we're doing wonderful. And uh, there seems to be a big uh, response out there for this, and people are liking it. And every week we want to bring you a new story, a new angle, and celebrate those in recovery. And that brings us to our guest. We've got Josh Lynch. How are you, buddy? Good. How you doing, Casey? So now you reached out to me uh, on Instagram and through a mutual friend, and uh, we want to find out your story. So we always like to start at the beginning. So where does Josh Lynch's story start? Where does my story start? Um, so I grew up out in Hooper, a small town um, and very LDS family. And uh, I so kind of to start, I guess we'll start off with like, the addiction, what I remember, but we, like, 12 years old was when I had my first drink. And um, growing up, I just, you know, a lot of, like, sometimes in elementary, there was some bullying, getting picked on. I hit a growth spurt kind of late. Because you're a big man. I'm I'm big now. But, yeah, that that happened about eighth grade. So there was, and I just, socially, I was awkward. And I just had a lot of negative, I remember always a lot of negative talk in my head. And, and, um, and then there was, you know, it kind of like a little bit of depression, darkness, you know, I remember waking up on a summer day and, and just being kind of depressed and which, which was always a conflict. And this is a conflict that has stuck with me 
forever. I, I grew up in a really good family. Both my parents were amazing parents, five sisters, which that could lead to addiction, <laughs> but I don't blame that. Yeah. I have five sisters. I'm the only boy, and um, I always felt like I should be happy. I should have this, but I, I, I wasn't deep down inside, if I had to be honest. So um, 12 years old, had f- my first drink, and, and I right out of the gate, I, had, I, I didn't know when to stop. Now, where does a 12-year-old get their first drink? Tell, tell us how you came up From that. friends, parents. Over at a party, the parents weren't there. They had alcohol, and which was weird to me because I didn't grow up in a home with alcohol mm-hmm. in it. Um, being um, a member of the church, they, you don't drink alcohol and stuff. And so, so, what, so at 12, given that that's your family background, it sounds like you're really close with your family and felt like it was a good home, and then you're over at this party. What made you accept the drink? I'm definitely friends were doing it peer pressure and just giving into that not wanting to not wanting to stand out any more than I already did in my head. Okay. In my head I already stood out. I already was, you know, competing with that every day. Yeah. And so um they started drinking and man one drink, the first drink obviously was disgusting and burned. Mm-hmm. And then um once the effects started kicking in, it's like wow. That made me feel like this. If I drink more, I'm going to feel awesome. If one's good, two's great. Oh, yeah. And if two is great? Four's better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That has been my mentality with drinking. And so um, right from the get-go, I remember that night, I was just, I was out. And all the other kids were having fun, and I just was in my own world thinking, wow, I don't. Every, my voice inside calmed down. Okay. So did you feel like you were more socially accepted after that? Yeah. Yeah, especially especially as it goes, the story goes on, and I I had kind of a little bit better to- tolerance with drinking. So then you become the kid that can put it away. It's kind of a badge of honor. You're you can drink. That's awesome. Yeah, and so you started uh, had your first drink at twelve years old, and did you just socially drink through high school and junior high? Yeah, so, um, yeah, just whenever, because it's hard, junior high, it's hard to get alcohol. But whenever it was there, I definitely was the one drinking. Going into high school, I was the one encouraging it. And then, um, you know, you run in, we started getting, mar- junior high was marijuana. We had, I had some friends that found marijuana, so I was smoking weed. And um, how old are you now? I'm 35. Okay. Yep, 35. So I just wanted to set the picture for everybody at home listening. So junior high and high school, a little bit of uh, marijuana and alcohol. At any point throughout that, did you think to yourself, man, I might have a problem? I I don't know. It was more of that the guilt and shame kicked in like crazy. Because of your upbringing in the LDS church? Because of my upbringing. I would say because of my upbringing and... I just I felt like I was going against me, like I, but it, I liked it. It was, it was a conflict, a huge conflict. I liked it and enjoyed it, and made me feel more comfortable. But at the same time, there was something wrong, and it wasn't right, and I had to hide it. Nobody could know about it, you know, except for the friends that were doing it with me. So the shame kicked in big time. And how did you? deal with that because I'm sure your parents would have been very disappointed if they had known you were smoking weed and drinking at such a young age. Were you able to hide it from them or did they find out at a certain point? I, I, I know I know they got called um they got called once by a parent that one of my friends had told their parent and they got called and I just I was an awesome turned out to be a really good liar, manipulator mm-hmm. and even a better shape shifter. I like going into like ninth, eighth, ninth grade, I didn't even know who I really was. I just I needed to shape shit to to fit in. And so it's I mean, I think this is, you know, from the psychologist's point of view here, like this is a fairly common thread where a young person feels kind of awkward and different. You'd mentioned you were a late bloomer and what we know developmentally is for boys for boys and girls it's better to be developing on time. But for for girls, it's a little bit better to be a late bloomer than an early bloomer. That can create some awkwardness for girls. And boys, it's the opposite. Being kind of manly and tough, being an early bloomer is kind of cool. Being a late bloomer can make you feel like the little kid in the group. And so it sounds like, you know, feeling awkward and on the outside, 
uh, feeling uh, picked on, like you mentioned, and then having that alcohol calm all of those feelings down must have created a real serious conflict within yourself because you had these morals and values that you were taught were right, very clear black and white teachings around alcohol and drugs, yet having alcohol and drugs made you feel like you always wanted to feel. That must have been a tough thing to deal with. Yeah, yeah, huge conflict. And then and then you get into the, well, God God doesn't want anything to do with me, you know. So that that started, you know, even going into high school, I kind of remember that going to like seminary and stuff, mm-hmm. and which is a, it's in high school, it's a religious class course that you take. And I just, I definitely didn't fit in there or belong. There was, you know, I just, I was a fake. Project Recovery will be right back. This sounds like a story that's probably similar to a lot of people who live in Utah. Sure. You know, that it's not that uncommon. I mean, I think we had Boyd in last week to talk on the podcast. And a lot of times when he was having problems with his kids, he'd uh, talk to his neighbors and other family members. And they'd say, well, that's just kids being kids. Right. I think there's, there's a lot of that attitude. But uh, I think that's wishful thinking on adults' part most of the time, that there are a lot of kids who – have um, an issue that might predispose them to addiction. And I think one of those is struggling with depression and anxiety. And it sounds like perhaps you'd struggled a little bit with both. And there are so many people that find some immediate relief with marijuana and alcohol that all of a sudden it becomes like, boy, if, if any of our listeners have ever felt really depressed or if you've ever felt really anxious and then you've been had a relief from that, you know how powerful that is. Because being anxious or depressed... Or both Miserable. is, oh, it's horrible. You it, would do just about it, anything. Absolutely. To, and that's where, you know, Band-Aids uh, are alcohol and marijuana and yeah. drugs. It just, just They have these immediate fix. effects yep. that kind of, like you said at the party right there at 12 years old, you felt this like, oh, relief from that anxiety and awkwardness. But, uh, of course, we know how that story progresses over time. But the interesting thing, and I, I think this happens here, like you mentioned, Casey, in Utah a lot, but also in, in lots of other communities that are very faith-based around these issues, where now we have an added layer of shame and, and guilt are related to your relationship with God. And what would you, how was that handled by you, Josh? Um, I, I, I would say, honestly, the best way I can describe it is just, a hundred percent isolation and it's not only like it wasn't a physical isolation because i'm a young kid it's kind of but it was like a spiritual isolation just shut down mm-hmm. those so you're feelings. going to church with your family every week going to seminary in high school but just feeling like spiritually disconnected oh yeah yeah big time so how long had you done alcohol and marijuana and before you It became a real problem. I mean, I'm not saying that it wasn't a problem before, but to where it started to affect your life. Um, I would, I would say, so I, I played sports. I, and I loved football, football. And so if I had to put my, put a finger on it, it would definitely be like my senior, junior year. Um, I, I, I feel like I had some potential to go on. I'm not, you know, no, no big school, but definitely like a small like a college or something, and I just didn't. I didn't care. Like if it was, if it was staying up all night. I remember going to a strength and conditioning um, thing that up at Weber State that we knew we had, and I partied all night long. Mm. And then the next morning, woke up, went to that, and just threw up the whole time. The guy that was helping us knew, and he and he sat sat us down. He's like, "You guys, like, get serious. Like this is a joke, you know." And and so I would say. That's where it would probably I could see that okay this is affecting my dreams it's affecting like what I like to do my it's taking over stuff that I enjoy and but you were will you you weren't willing to give up the drugs and alcohol and the partying for that dream that was that was where you noticed they started to cross over and the and the substances became more important than the dream is that what you're saying more yeah yeah I would say more important is it just there wasn't a there wasn't an ability to say no, like mm-hmm. if it was like if it's like we're gonna party tonight, 
oh, well, I got football tomorrow. I, I can't do that. I'll get up sick again. That sucked. I was like, all right, let's party. And did you see, did your friends handle it differently? Did they all handle it that way or were some able to say no? They No, I would say most of them. I probably had one or two that were a lot like me. Um, but the rest of them, they could say no. They could cut it off. They could cut it off for football season, which didn't make any sense to me. That yeah. that was the time to. That was kind of the time to party. So yeah, I would definitely say we, there's. I was definitely in the worst on that. Yeah. All right. So now you're graduating high school. What is Josh into now? So I had. Um, so there was uh, in the football season. We we're going in to to the playoffs. It was going to be a really good recru- recruited game, and I, I had my competition that was up against me. I was going to look good. I, I was pretty. I was going to look good in front of him, and I, I, in practice, had a guy roll over my knee and and tear my MCL, and so that was a point. I, I was pretty low, um, with everything, and I kind of I, I decided to cut everything off. I, I got rid of friends. I um. Had a really good experience. Decided that I I was going to go on a mission, a mission for the church, and um, I was always raised you go on a mission. Um, but there, in my senior year, I if I could have got a scholarship, gone and played football, which I look back now would not have been good. I I would have gone and done that. But I I'd made the choice to go on a mission, and I really I stopped everything. I stopped I stopped the partying. I I got rid of friends that were doing that which caused a lot of problems. And um, for once in my life, I would say I kind of stood up and said, this is what I'm going to do, mm. and really got serious and, and went went on a mission, graduated high school um, and went on a mission in November of 2013. Did you complete the mission? I did. I did. I served the whole two years, and um, I did have an experience in the mission. So once again, kind of, I, I didn't, no substance abuses on on the mission. No, nothing crazy. Um, I had a companion one time that had a, a bad back, and I I can't even remember what I had. I had something, and and he um, and if we go back into high school, I remember I had a friend that got some Loratab from Mexico, and came up, and I remember that's that's the first time I tried painkillers, and I I loved them. Mm. I loved the way they made me feel. They didn't stink. I didn't have to hide it. I could be around. I I loved them, but I didn't understand any like how would you ever get them? And that's so I never. So how about with your knee injury? A lot of <coughs> uh, a lot of people we've spoken to have have mentioned that through a real injury or surgery, uh, that's where they were introduced to that. Did you get prescribed uh, painkillers of any sorts? I I didn't, which was which is surprising, uh-huh. but I did. When I got my wisdom teeth out, and I got prior to your mission, prior to my mm-hmm. mission, different mindset. I took what I needed, and I ended up giving my buddy the rest of them because mm. he really wanted them. So, so, so you, you, you've had a, a sample with uh, painkillers, really liked them, and when does it become a problem for you? So this is, um, I, I remember I wanted to bring this up on my mission. This guy gave me some, I don't even know what it was. It was, a, it was an opioid. And I remember we would get like on these taxis, on these motorcycles, and I was going down a hill and that kicked in. And I was like, why would anybody want to do anything different than this? <laughs> I went out and had incredible conversations with people. I felt, And I remember that thought, like that one time on, on my mission, and then, and that was the only time I took it or anything. And then, so I get back from my mission, um, and about four months returned from my mission, got into um, drinking again with, um, and and it's interesting because I never got over shame. I I went and served a mission, and never got over that that shame that God I. I would read something, and I would say, man, that would be awesome to talk to that person about it. I never internalized anything. Nothing was for me. I was, I was a lost cause. So that, that early experience starting to drink when you were 12 and you using marijuana in high school and through, through junior high and high school really hurt, I would guess, your self-esteem is what it sounds like. That you really started to think 
very poorly about yourself that I think you said, you know, that self-talk internal dialogue. And even after you like made a commitment to stop and spent two whole years um, as a missionary, you, that didn't improve. That that self talk was still it was negative. Huh? It was yeah, extremely. And and it's weird because I got so good at putting up a front that no one from the outside I looked like I would never struggle with something like that. Yeah, I did. I mean, walking into a room, I was isolated. I was a weird one. I was awkward, um, but I'm very social and I can put off a good front. So you had that feeling inside of awkwardness, but outside people probably thought you were a very friendly, outgoing person. Yeah. Interesting. So what you said just four months after coming back, being essentially sober for those two years except for the the using the opioid on, on your mission, what what sparked the drinking then four months? That um, seems like a short period of time after yeah, a mission. It was quick and, and returning back from a mission is rough. Um you get back and you're you're thrown back and what do you do with life? Mm-hmm. You had this Awesome, and I did. I had an incredible mission. I loved, I loved my mission. Amazing people, and I, I had a really good time. And you get back, and you're just, you, you're lost. And I had a companion that had returned also. That I made good friends with, and he was drinking, and his brothers. He got back a few months before me, and I just fell back into it. I, and I think it's more of just. That's one thing I always tell kids is it might not be a problem now, but I I feel like when I was a kid, I learned to cope with life with substances. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what I did. I mean, yeah. that's that's where you're learning your coping skills. Yeah, the, no, from a developmental standpoint, those formative years through, you know, junior high and high school, absolutely. You're learning how do I get my needs met? How do I deal with the stressors of life? And if you're introduced to something that's so powerful and immediate during those years, then it's easy to feel drawn back to that when you're an adult and you you go through stressful times. And I think for our listeners that aren't familiar with missionaries, that many, many missionaries feel a little lost for that for the first few months when they get home from their mission, not knowing where to go since they've had that purpose for two years. And so it was during that time that you reverted back to feeling comforted by alcohol. Yeah, and it was almost subconsciously. It was almost like that that kicked in, like, well, my brain told me, well, it helped back then. Why would it not help now? And then I, and I, and that, that got to where I was drinking by myself. I'm a return missionary. It's not like I'm going to go hang out in a bar, so I'm drinking by myself. It's very, it would, I would say shameful is not an understatement for a return missionary to be drinking and, and using drugs. Yeah. 